According to special counsel John Durham's report, a university researcher felt threatened by staffers of Congressman Adam Schiff after he refused to meet their demands uh, that, they, that they analyze former President Trump's suspected collusion with Russia. Durham's report alleges that back in November of 2018, the researcher and one of his colleagues met with two of Schiff's staffers on Capitol Hill for a meeting that was ostensibly about university research contracts. The researcher claims they instead were asked to analyze a news article about alleged links between the Trump Organization and Russia's Alpha Bank. The researcher told Durham that when he declined and said it would be inappropriate, he felt threatened by Schiff's staffers, who responded, quote, we are now in charge, an apparent reference to Schiff's leadership position on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Meanwhile, journalist Aaron Mate hit out at the New York Times characterization of the Durham report as, quote, lending credence to conservatives, quote, conspiracy theories about the FBI. He tweeted, quote, the Durham report newly debunks the conspiracy theory that the New York Times and other Blue Anon outlets promoted that Trump and his campaign conspired with Russia. It also shows the top U.S. officials ignored credible intelligence that this conspiracy theory was a Clinton campaign plot. Now, this, of course, comes just after Republican representatives Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene shared that she will introduce articles of impeachment against FBI Director Christopher Wray. She tweeted, under his watch, the FBI has intimidated, harassed, and entrapped Americans who have been deemed enemies of the Biden regime. Wray has turned the FBI into Joe Biden and Merrick Garland's personal police force. Christopher Wray needs to be impeached. So. Yeah. So with respect to the first uh, bit of the story, you know, it was interesting. <laughs> yeah, it is interesting. I mean, I do think that at a certain point, I got to say that the framing of the, the, the threat and coercion, there's certainly there are soft pressure that can be applied and it's inappropriate to use the status of your office, to try to coerce independent university um, uh, uh, employees. Mm -hmm. That was their concern. They said, we're, we're in a public university. This isn't appropriate for us to be weighing in on these kinds of um, Yeah, they said they got called inquiries. down to the Capitol building to talk. They thought they were talking about something else. Right. And then Adam Schiff's staff spring on them this, this oh, do you please analyze the potential for collusion in some document? Yeah. And it was very, and then they were like, yeah, you, we're in charge. We're about to be in charge. So you have to do this. Yeah, it seems very weird. Obvi behavior. It's obviously inappropriate. Um, and just weird. It, and and weird. I, you know, it does speak to what the culture was around that time, where people. I mean, Russia, Russia hysteria was really extreme, and people felt very. Democrats felt very validated mm -hmm. in pursuing all kinds of, I think, unconventional courses of action because they felt like it was what needed to be done to save democracy and those kinds of things. And frankly, it is that that instinct, which has, I think, done so much to corrode democratic commitment to things like free speech principles that used to be really core to the party's interests. Now, I also appreciate Aaron Mate pointing out the kind of lack of humility among a lot of liberal outlets that ran with these kind of stories and in the face of the dorm report are doubling down in some respects and trying to downplay the implications here. So I do appreciate Aaron Mataibi and others who have been very much critics of the left from the left on these uh, Russia phobia uh, accusations for years, really taking this moment to clarify what this news really means. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's time for some for some setting the record straight on this just total, yeah, Russia phobia, um, just a bad, a, a unsupported by evidence that was coming out all the time about the extent of the influence operation and the extent of uh, officials and campaigns going along with it, 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 how much it mattered. It just, it frankly didn't matter that much. And I absolutely understand this frustration with law enforcement that was utterly culpable in spreading this idea in, in, on so many fronts. Uh, two main things. One is communicating constantly with media organizations and, and kind of leaking very selective framing so that media organizations right. could run with headline after headline mm -hmm. about how, oh, this issue where you think Americans actually haven't made up their mind about something? Well, half the side is all Russian. They, they're, you know, they, they have little <laughs> tractor beams on their heads, and Russia is telling them what to sure. think. Uh, that kind of breathless coverage on one hand, and then on the other is, is pressure 
that mm-hmm. they exerted on social media companies to censor speech on, because of this issue, to say your platform is compromised. Yeah. It's like a, it's a, it's an organism that is sick yeah. with a Russian infection, and you're not taking the proper steps to heal it. That's a national security concern that's undermining democracy, and there could be legislation to help to help you deal with that. Right. Well, we this this environment and this criti- critique of the FBI certainly does make for a ripe environment for some yeah. substantive reform of the institution. Uh, we I do not to- have faith in this. Uh, just to, to Marjorie Taylor Greene's impeachment, I don't know about impeachment, but I don't have any faith in Christopher Wray to lead the agency at this point. I, I, th- I think it would definitely benefit from new leadership. So what's interesting, Christopher Wray um, was uh, nominated by George Bush in 2003 to be assistant attorney general for the DOJ's criminal division. He started serving um, as the eighth director of the FBI in, on August 2nd of 2017 at the beginning of the Trump administration. It's interesting for him to be the focus of this. Partisan lines seem to have kind of completely broken down over this, and it's much more about, I guess, the institutional um, bias uh, that's built in as opposed to historically folks going after folks on the basis of there being a Clinton employee and the bias being inferred from that. I mean, right. I mean, it, it, it goes a little bit to what I w- we were just talking about uh, with Caitlin Collins and CNN. Like, yeah, he was appointed. He was a Bush Republican. Doesn't doesn't make him. I mean, maybe he still calls himself Republican. And in his case, he probably absolutely does still call himself Republican or or whatever he's supposed to call himself. From I don't know if it's a nonpartisan kind of thing. Clearly, he was appointed by Republicans, but I, 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 he's clearly not operating in a way that comports with the expectations of of Trump world, and uh, or in fact seems to comport with some very basic concerns we have about the well, beha- behavior of the FBI. Well, that's the thing. I'm not sure what we know about what his personal role has been in any of this, and I, you know, look forward to seeing this reported sure, out a little bit more. Top. Responsibility starts at the top. Well, where responsibility lies and what was actually driving some of the failures that the Durham report uncovered are two different things. Um, the Durham report went out of its way to say, like, to protect some of the FBI's, to defend some of the choices that were made by some members of the FBI versus others in the context of the report, which was jarring and disappointing to some conservatives. And it is interesting. Uh, I, I wanted to mention earlier, we I actually asked Marjorie Taylor Greene about this when she was on the show a few weeks ago, specifically because I agreed with her rhetoric around defunding the FBI. I asked her at the time if there had been any legislation that she'd been working on or making an effort to promulgate to that end, and she said no. Now this is coming forward, which I do think is some movement on following up on rhetorical claims that she got a lot of support for and traction around. But again, this is falling short still of calling for defunding the institution. And going after this one particular person, it's not clear to me, is well tailored to actually getting at the root of the problem. Well, let's play that clip. Yeah. Uh, have you made any moves to actually pursue legislation that would get get to the bottom of what your goals are there? Or was it, as many people argued at the time, a kind of performative call that was more linked from your perspective to um, absolving uh, Donald Trump from the kinds of interrogations that were happening against him? Mm, no, not, not performative at all. Um, I, I really don't have time for anything like that. I didn't come to Washington to, to be a performer. I came here to make real changes for our country, and um, it's been a difficult change in my life to do so. But I think these changes are very important. I don't think our nation's uh, law enforcement or Department of Justice should be used uh, as a political weapon. That's the weaponization of government, and that's something that should terrify every single American, no matter how they vote. And, And again, the Republican Party has the opportunity to make changes in the budget and the appropriations uh, bills that we pass. And that's where I think that we can make changes like that. And I'm going to work very hard in my conference uh, uh, using the power of my voting card um, to vote for a budget or appropriation bills uh, to be sure that we can hold the FBI accountable and the Department of Justice accountable. And I just think that's the right thing to do.
What I'm gathering is she took to heart what you said, and this is why she's demanding action on Christopher well, Ray as quite. a starter. I mean, here's, here's the but problem. But we got to go all the way. Here's the problem. There are ongoing debt ceiling negotiations where Marjorie Taylor Greene and others have specifically said we have a spending problem, um, not a funding problem. But when you, which I disagree with fundamentally, but if you do go to the spending problem, none of them have agreed to make any cuts to the military budget or despite the, 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 the debt ceiling cliff, um, and the exigency of the current situation and the stated interest in curbing the funding of this institution, there are no bills and there's no negotiation about actually cutting funding to this institution or the military. Mm. So again, I appreciate her saying that she doesn't mean this as a performative stunt, but when you're going after the head of the FBI and not trying to defund the FBI, when you say that you support uh, that you don't support the war uh, in Ukraine and that you're anti-war, but she explicitly again said to us in that interview that she does not want to cut a cent of Biden's military budget, what are, are, are the stated goals really aligning with people's actions? Mm. I think we're actually going to talk a little bit about the budget later in the show, so we'll save the discussion for that. More rising right after this.